All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Marie Amateur Radio Club first Thursday of the month meeting. Uh, here we talk about the basics. And so this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to go over what a repeater is, how they work. And at the end of this three and a half minute presentation, <laughs> you will know everything that there is to know about repeaters. And to pass the test after, huh? Right. So to start off, a repeater. Hmm. There was a movie called Brewster's Millions. Uh, Richard Pryor, he uh, inherited a bunch of money. And there was this guy who would follow him and repeat everything that he said. Do you all remember Brewster's Millions? I remember the movie, but I don't remember that guy. Okay, well, that's that's the best definition of a repeater I know of. <laughs> as far as ham radio goes, a repeater is a system of electronic equipment that receives a signal on one frequency and then at the same time transmits the signal or repeats the signal on another frequency. So we know what the definition of a repeater is, right? It's a set of a lot of different pieces of equipment working together uh, to repeat your transmission on your radio. But there's another aspect to repeaters that we need to understand. And when you look uh, on the internet for uh, repeaters and the repeater frequencies, you need to understand what you're looking at because it could be confusing. And so we're going to, we're going to address that here. Understanding this will help you understand what repeaters are and how they work. So as an example, if you were go to if you were to go to the Murray Murray the uh, VHF Society webpage and go and do a search for Utah repeaters, you'll get a screen that looks like it has that color. And if you go down to the 1.25 meter repeater list, you'll see our repeater there. It shows the frequency. And the other thing that we're interested in is the CTCSS. We're going to talk about all of this stuff. And you're going to see a little symbol right next to the frequency. If you were to go to the re, uh, repeater book online or just basically do a search for repeaters in my area. So you could do this in Minneapolis or New York. Uh, or anywhere you want to, uh, you do a search for repeaters in my area, and you may get a, a, a screen that looks similar to this. And I did this for uh, repeaters in Utah on the 1.25 meter band. And sure enough, here's our uh, club repeater. And you can see that there's a frequency there which is 2239600 with an offset of negative 1.6 megahertz with a tone of 103.5. Now, you may not understand what any of that stuff is, but we're going to address that right now. As a matter of fact, what you do is you take the frequency that you see, which is always the receive frequency of your radio, okay? Whether it's a handheld, whether it's a mobile radio, whether it's a base station. Every time, every time you look at a directory of repeater frequencies, those frequencies are the receive frequency of your radio, okay? If it's the receive frequency of the radio, then what's the transmit frequency of the repeater? The same frequency. The same frequency. 
So the repeater is transmitting on that frequency, okay? I'm receiving on that frequency. So to find out what the other side of the solution is, because here's, here's the problem. Um, transmitters, transmitters, repeaters are doing this at the same time, transmitting and receiving at the same time. They're actually receiving and then transmitting at the same time. So how, how does that happen? Well, they use an offset frequency. The offset frequency is for the 1.25 meter band, 1.6 megahertz, which means that it tells you you need to subtract 1.6 megahertz from the receive frequency, and that'll tell you what your transmitter frequency is at, okay? So when you transmit and you're looking at the display, you'll actually see 222.360 because of the negative offset of 1.6 megahertz. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, repeaters and what's actually going on. Like we already said, all of the documentation on the internet and everything else, the books that you get, the apps on your phone, it's everything is relationship to your radio. So the transmit, the receive frequency is what is displayed. And then you have to know what the offset is. Okay. So Again, when you look at the uh, VHF Society webpage, you know that it's a negative offset because there's a negative right there. And because it's a 1.25 meter band, um, we know that it is 1.6 uh, megahertz. The 70 centimeter offset is what? Five megahertz. Five megahertz. Negative or positive? Always negative. Always negative. Okay, so you know right off the bat that if you're dealing with a 70 centimeter uh, frequency, which is the 440 megahertz band, you know right off the bat that the offset is negative five megahertz. What is it for the two meter band? Anything above uh, 147 is positive, below 147 is negative. That is so close. There's some there's some mix-ups in that though. Um, and as a matter of fact, you, you could be right on. There's the bottom line is it goes both ways, positive or negative. So when you're looking at the repeater book, uh, you need to see if that's a plus or a minus. And and I think you are right, Dave. That's that's the way it is. Um, so Here's my HT, my handheld transceiver. I'm going to, I'm receiving on 22396, and I want to talk to my friends on the other side of the valley, okay? Now, HTs, they cannot, they're not powerful enough to go through the mountain, okay? Um, if they were, then I wouldn't want to be standing near the antenna, <laughs> He would have a bad day. Um, so what happens is uh, they build repeaters up on these high places. And guess what? Uh, along the, in Utah, all of our repeaters, 90% of them are up on mountains. Some of them are on high buildings. Okay. And that's what people that are outside of Utah have to do. They they do it on large buildings. So it's four, four people. Four people, because yes. Don't have any mountains. Don't have any snow to shovel. <laughs> we've had nothing but water right <laughs> that's right so i'm transmitting and i want to talk to these guys over here so i have to use this repeater so um when i transmit it's transmitting on 222.360 okay and and it's doing that and i really don't even know about it because i've already set up uh, the configuration in my ht and if you were in the uh, class that we talked about HTs and how to do that, you'll you'll know how to do that. When I'm transmitting, of course, this uh, lightning bolt is going at the speed of light. It hits the repeater. The repeater is listening 
on 22236 because that's what I'm transmitting on. A couple milliseconds after he receives that uh, signal, and if he hears a PL tone associated with that signal, and we're going to talk about PL tones, the repeater will then re will then transmit whatever he received onto the transmit frequency of 22396. The repeater's transmit frequency is your receive frequency, right? And so I'm the repeater is now transmitting on 22396. And all of these radios here and everybody, even over here, uh, they are receiving on 22396. So the repeater transmits on 22396. The HT or mobile radio receives on 22396. Okay. If the repeater does not hear, and I'm talking about the Murray Amateur Radio Club's 220 repeater, if the repeater does not hear the sub audible tone, which we've identified and configured as 103.5 hertz, uh, the repeater will not repeat. Okay. Um, he'll just ignore that transmission. Okay. So the PL tones are very important to have. So my question is, how can a radio receive and transmit at the same time? We've got a comment from the Zoom. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Dan Arango says, uh, sometimes the delay before transmit key up is greater due to anti chunking It waits to make sure the RX signal doesn't drop quickly. That is correct. You want to maybe repeat the question for- Sure, so, so there are, there are people, and I heard it today while I'm waiting in the car, that like to kerchunk the repeater. And what that means is they'll take their radio, whether it's a handheld or mobile, or I don't care what it is, and they'll key or they'll push the transmit button, and then they'll release it. And they do that without IDing themselves. That is an illegal operation. It is a no-no. We do not want to kerchunk the repeater. The requirement for the FCC is you ID every time you're transmitting, okay? Um, and so to get around that, and this happens a lot, especially right before nets, you hear kerchunking all the time. And what the person does is they'll transmit just for a brief second and release it. And then they are listening for the repeater to come back and, and uh, give some type of tone or something. You, you know when the re you've reached the repeater because you can see that signal on, the, on your radio uh, that the repeater's answering back. Okay, that's what the person is doing just to make sure that they can th hit the repeater, okay, that it's able to repeat. So there's a configuration in many uh, repeaters that require that the transmission be a little bit longer than a second before the repeater repeats, okay? To combat this thing that lazy ham radio operators do, okay? Uh, and if you fall into that, if you fall into that category, um, then um, please stop it. Everybody does it. I've done it, okay? And it's taken some time for me to consistently say, okay, I want to um, see if I can hit the repeater. And so all I do is N7XDO. You could hear that a repeater coming back. There you go. So if I were to wait a little bit, this is November 7, X-ray Delta Lima, testing one, two, three, three, two, one. Then that repeater picks it up. So there's like a half second that, that we wait on the Murray Amateur Radio Club. So that actually teaches you good repeater etiquette. And that is when you want to talk on the repeater, push the, push the talk mic 
and inhale and then speak. Okay. And that'll give the repeater time enough to go ahead and uh, repeat what you're, uh, what you want. Okay. And your sentences are not going to be cut off. Yes, Steve. I found this, maybe with BYG, I've got it a little more intensely, but sometimes I pick it up and accidentally get to the TV. I didn't mean to. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I do that too. Sometimes I'll take my microphone off my cradle in my car and I'll accidentally hit PTT. You know, there today, I don't know too many uh, uh, Gestapos that are looking for that. Okay. So, so, so technically, it's not illegal to chunk the repeater if you follow it up with your ID within the next 10 minutes. So, if you accidentally chunk, wow. Just after you've done that, key up and say, Katie says it's a WB or, or your call sign. Okay, I'll use yours. And then <laughs> just, you're using my and, uh, Steve's going to use uh, Jan's call sign when he kerchunks. Then you're legal because you didn't, you, you don't have to ID at the beginning of your transmission. You have to ID at the end or every 10 minutes. Remember, the ID rules are at the end of your conversation. Or every 10 minutes during your conversation, right? So that first kerchunk is okay if you follow it up with your ID within 10 minutes. Now, nobody does that, right? Right. But if you accidentally kerchunk the radio, go ahead and just throw your ID out and use it. You're legal. Beautiful. So back to the question at hand How can a repeater transmit and receive at the same time? To me, that's just magical. PFM. Say again? PFM. PFM? <laughs> okay, PFM, pure freaking magic. Um, that is that is correct. <laughs> but there is a little science behind it, okay? So we're, we're, we're going to talk about that. So let's, let's see how it works. Like we know what the definition is, the definition is a system of electronic equipment. Let's see what that system consists of. It consists of a receiver. It consists of a transmitter, a duplexer, an antenna, and supporting items. Okay, so, ah, look at that. There's a receiver, which is a radio. There's a transmitter, which is another radio. A duplexer, what the heck is that? Something that duplexes. Uh, we're going to find out what that does. An antenna, obviously, and things to hook it all up, like a tower and coax or heliax, uh, connectors. You need to power it, so there's a battery or or uh, AC power. Uh, there's a power supply, etc. Well, oh. say again? And a controller. Wait no more, because here is what our repeater looks like. We have that explains it all. That ex exactly right. <laughs> Just hang tight. You're gonna you're gonna um, you're gonna be amazed. You're gonna be amazed at how much you you know when you walk out of here. As a matter of fact, um, I suspect that when you leave, your IQ will be increased by a magnitude of ten. It, it has to. Understanding repeaters will put you there. Okay. Starting pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> just as long as you don't have an iq of zero like me then it doesn't matter what the magnitude is <laughs> okay so <clears throat> i digress so the repeater the main portion of the repeater that contains the uh, radios is in this section right here this contains the power supply it's plugged into the 120 volt outlet um, there's a possibility that we can hook it directly to 12 volt batteries. Um, hopefully that'll happen sometime in our lifetimes. Um, there's a controller. A controller has to, is, it does what? It controls. Okay. See, this, this is a presentation for people like me who <laughs> need it to be this simple. A controller controls, and what does he control? Well, when he receives something, uh, he knows if it's associated with the PL tone, okay? 
We haven't talked about that yet. We will. It'll go ahead and retransmit that. And it goes through this duplexer. These canisters here are what a duplexer is. And we're going to talk about what that is. But here's, here's the deal. And this is why we have duplexers on radios. The receiver has to listen to signals that are a millivolt or a millionth of a volt, okay? Very faint signals, okay? That's what your re radios are receiving. You have to have a really good receiver to be able to, to hear that. At the same time, however, the transmitter, our transmitter is 40 watts, okay? It's transmitting on the same coax, on the same antenna. We have one antenna that's receiving and transmitting at the same time. That truly is amazing. How does he do that? He does it because of these duplexers. So we're going to go to a breakout of what the duplexers are. The duplexers are, there's a pair of duplexers. Let me go back to the previous screen. You can see that there are two duplexers, uh, two uh, canisters in front. There's also two in the back. A transmit, the transmit radio has um, a pair of duplexers and the receive radio has a pair of duplexers. So let's, let's talk about that. And this is where the magic happens. On the receive uh, antenna, the signals are coming through and each canister does something very unique. One canister does a band reject. It's a band reject filter. And the other one is a band pass filter. What that means is on the band reject, he is designed to take out, filter out all other frequencies that uh, are around um, that he's receiving off the antenna because the antenna is not only receiving the transmission that you're doing, okay, but any other transmission that is going on, which could be on the 156 megahertz band, it could be other 220 bands, it could be 440, it could be 800 megahertz. He's he's receiving all of the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? That's what antennas do. They, they, uh, they collect that, okay? Now, it helps that the antenna is uh, built so that he listens best to the frequency that he's designed to listen to. But he also is hearing a bunch of other stuff out there, okay? If you were to put uh, a spectrum analyzer on the antenna without going through the band reject and the band pass filter, you would see frequencies all over the place, okay? As a matter of fact, and I'm going to come back to this uh, picture here, repeaters are typically on mountaintops or we're or places where other repeaters are at. So you have all kinds of RF that is vying for your attention, right? And I don't want to hear uh, the Crossroads repeater at the same time that I'm hearing our repeater. I want to hear just our conversations, right? So there has to be a way to filter that out. More That's to, more to the point at some repeater sites, you might have a 50,000 watt transmitter for it. AM radio station or TV yeah. or something like that, a TV channel or something like that. So you don't want that much power plowing into your radio's receiver and potentially overwhelming you. And you need to have a method that will take that RF power and it's like shooting a bullet in water, it stops it, right? I mean, it travels a little bit, but if you, if you, apply a, a nine millimeter to AR 500 metal, <laughs> it will stop it. Um, that's a bad analogy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, the band reject is rejecting everything except that frequency of, now this is the, uh, um, this is the receive side of the repeater. So 222.36. 
That's what he is designed to do. He is receiving on 22236. And he's rejecting everything else. Yes, sir. How do they how do they program those things to do that? Okay. Great question. Repeat the you, for the, yeah. Okay, so the question is, how do you program these canisters to do that? Along with that, how, how narrow is this thing programmed? Yeah. Okay, so on the receive side, you can get very, you can get within a hertz level. Okay, um, see these little rods that come up with little dials on top. Those are the actual tuning fork, if you will, that is changing um, when you screw it clockwise, it goes down into the canister and it affects, I wish I had a picture of the inside, but it, it affects the frequency that uh, that it's receiving or transmitting on, okay? So they're inductors, basically. They're what? Yes, it's an, in, an inductor, but there's more to it than that. Um, it's very, very sensitive. It has to be very, very precise. This is why these canisters are very, very expensive. Well, it has to be a resonant thing. And it's obviously, yeah. It's got, it's got some capacity, too. Uh, right. And you do one or the other. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. There's capacitance that's involved. There's inductance that's involved. Uh, but you introduce that when you hook up your coax to your antenna, okay? Everything changes the, the signal, right? And so if you were to look at a uh, canister for 900 megahertz system, the canisters are quite a bit smaller because the frequencies are a lot higher. The higher the frequency, the smaller these canisters are. You should see the canisters on AM broadcasting studios. They are massive but they have them and especially the radios, the repeaters that are on the sharing the same uh, mountaintop or building top, you want to be able to reject all of the stuff that you don't want to hear. At the same time, you have a band pass. So this canister is only letting through the 22236 frequency. Yes, sir. It, I'm, I'm confused. It sounds like the band rejects and the band pass do the same thing. Close. What's the notch filter, right? The first one, the band reject? Band reject. Um, oh, it, re it, it could be the other way around. Here's what you have to think. On the band reject. The way I understood it, it's a little bit different. I understood that one was a low pass and one was a high pass. Right. And the difference between the two is that one or two hertz that you're looking for that passes. The one is the get rejected by the above pass. your signal, and the other is blocking everything below your signal. So only your signal gets through the two of them. Does that make sense? Maybe that's just how I yeah. made sense of it. But it could be that there's other thing. ways of building these. I know that Sammy, who built this, one is a dedicated band pass, and one's a dedicated band reject. But the result between the green arrow and the red arrow or blue arrow is only a very narrow band of frequencies gets through. Yes. From the blue yeah. to the green. The idea is when from the antenna, when the uh, frequency is coming through, by the time it hits the radio, you are only within a couple hertz listening to 22236. Yes, sir. Wouldn't this have to be the bandwidth of the signal? I mean, yeah. 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 Not not one or two hertz. Correct. Well, that's how it flows in the radio. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So the key factor is that the receive radio doesn't hear what the transmit radio is transmitting. That's exactly. Why you have the offset. Yeah. That's uh, one reason why you have the offset. Absolutely. The equipment you use to calibrate it. Turn it down. Um, he used spectrum analyzers do that there's there's an i an rf signal that he sends through and it's calibrated and he knows what he's then receiving okay there's not a dial on it says there's an adjustment yeah but it's not labeled yeah it's not like this this adjustment knob is done in-house okay when he's building the canister 
Oh, okay. And if something happens where things go out of whack, um, you know, it could be temperature changes. It could be other things where, you know, just a slight variation will go ahead and, and change that. Um, you can go ahead and do that. But it's it's pretty locked down. Um, you have to unloosen some nuts to even turn the, these things because you don't want to move those. So when you put in that three, that uh, radio, the two radios there, did you put in those canisters? Yes. They were part of the deal. Yeah. Okay. This here and this here is the repeater. So I've heard them called cavities before. Yes. A typical term. Yep. Cavities is another term that you'll hear. Okay, so the same thing happens to the transmit. The transmit is only letting through two two, uh, in this case two two three nine six zero megahertz, and of course the bandwidth of that. Okay, <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be technical in this basic class. Yes, we're testing. I don't understand why you would need that going out. Wouldn't it just be automatically programmed that way to send it directly out? No, because I have, you need to remember, I have neighbors that when I'm transmitting on 22396, I don't want to have any harmonics sent out. I don't want to have any anything else except that frequency. Also, yes, sir. to the point, uh, you, you might have missed our class when Paul brought in his spectrum analyzer, and some radios are less good at not sending out transmissions on frequencies you didn't want. So that filter definitely blocks any of that from getting from the radio out to the antenna. And if you over modulate, it goes out of band. It blocks that as well, right? So the word. Yep. So on the mountaintop, again, there's lots of RF that that each each of these repeaters do not want to listen to just he just wants to listen to his own now our antenna farm is something lot simpler it's a single antenna that does both transmit and receive okay he even has a guy hanging off of it, so he's there and this guy it. we hired there to stay there to make sure that uh, the antenna is is there the eyes off when the wind blows. yes he's talking and receiving at the same time right that's he right. actually that is how repeaters work the guy's just yelling <laughs> so one thing you might note on here is there's two more antennas on that tower yeah. those are active one is a transmit antenna and one is a receive antenna so you, you don't have to do everything through one antenna like we do you can do all the transmitting through one antenna and the receiving through a different antenna. And I think like a Farnsworth actually has the receive antenna located a couple of hundred yards away yep. from the transmit antenna yep. because of the noise profile of the, of the top of the mountain. But uh, so they still have the cavities like this, but they're not tied in through that little T intersection back to the same antenna. They would have two separate antennas. And there's literally a T that connects these two sets of canisters, to, canisters together that goes out. That goes out uh, to the lightning arrestor inside the building. Uh, and then it goes to hard line at that point onto uh, up to the antenna. Who's the other antenna? Murray Power. Power. And one is, like uh, Jan said, one is dedicated uh, as a uh, transmit antenna. The other one is dedicated as a receive antenna. Would that be good, you know, having the two antennas and possible because of uh, more heavy use or multiple people? No, um, there, you can go both ways. There's more to break. The more piece uh, components you have up there. But then again, we're putting all of our eggs in one basket, you know, so it depends on if you look at your glass half full or half empty. So I'm not sure that there's a technical reason uh, to have two antennas versus one. Uh, but I do know that our system is so good, the effective radiated power 
on ours is 300 and I think 60 watts. Okay. And that's for how many watts actually going? 40 through? watts leaving the radio. the radio. So we have a high gain antenna. Uh, we have really low loss uh, coax. Okay, LMR 400 and Heliax. Thank you very much. And it is tuned so that when we're transmitting 40 watts, just about all of it uh, ends up with the, you know, up at the antenna. There's a little bit of loss, of course. Yes, sir. I, I apologize for asking so many questions. Don't ever apologize, okay? I didn't apologize. That thank was you. this guy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't hear an apology from you. The uh, lightning arrestor really disturbs me. I used to work for Rocky Mountain Power. And for us, a lightning arrestor was a rod down into the ground. And you're telling me that that, that coax that goes up to the tower acts as a lightning rod? No. no. Good. Explain that a little more for you. Okay. The antenna tower and antenna and coax are one solid piece of electrically connected entity, okay? You, are you familiar with, with what Heliax looks like? Yes. Okay, so Heliax, for those who do not, it is a, either a field foam or an air core, and it has a really thick con center conductor and the outside conductor is a copper hard ribbed material. It is solid, okay? And they do that because it, it allows the, uh, the RFs to go through the uh, coax with very little loss, okay? The, uh, every single tower that you see they're all running a hard line. They call it hard line because of that solid copper corrugated tube that acts as the shield, okay? At the top of the antenna, we've uh, uncovered about three inches of that. We shaved away the, uh, uh, the shielding or the, the PVC and we put a grounding clamp on there and tied it to the tower. Halfway down, we did it again. All the way down to the tower, we did it again. So the coax is actually bonded to the tower. Okay. So there the, are, I'm sorry. That's the lightning arrestor. There are, uh, we haven't even gotten into the building yet. Okay. So the large uh, legs to this uh, and to the antenna. Each one of those goes to uh, a rod that I think is go down 16 feet at least. Okay. But that's encased in concrete. Oh, concrete. Yeah, that, that's that's okay. And it, and I th it may even go below that. Um, I don't know how big that concrete block is that's holding this up. Um, I'm sure it's more than four inches. three, <laughs> four. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they have, that is grounded. Um, the entire building is grounded. As a matter of fact, you go into the, the, uh, the shack and this is holds true with any repeater system, repeater building. You'll see a big grounding, uh, line that completely covers, goes around the perimeter of, of the room. Okay. And everything that is in that room gets tied to that. And you'll see a large cable that goes out to another grounding rod. Those are all grounded to the service entrance. Okay, everything is bonded together so that everything acts as the same potential. One of the problems that people have when they're doing their grounding is that they isolate their antenna and their ham radio shack from their house wiring. Okay, and even though they're using lightning uh, ground rods in there, the difference could be hundreds of volts, okay? You have to 
bond your your grounding all together so that everything's at the same potential okay um so the same thing happens with this antenna system here everything is bonded to the tower the tower uh there's a lot of rods that are going there uh in the ground for that you also have the coax now comes in to the building and i let's see you can see just a little bit right here. There's a large copper bar that all of the antennas uh, links that are on all the repeaters go to, and they're connected with a, a uh, lightning arrestor. What that lightning arrestor does is he he's taking the uh, center conductor because right now everything is isolated. The center conductor hasn't touched the, the grounding part of it. Otherwise you'd get a short, right? So that, let me go back to this one right here. So this radiating element right here, um, it actually is DC grounded, but that's another discussion. Um, but for our discussion here, this is isolated from everything else. And so, oh, by the way, you can see on top of this tower, there's a, a lightning rod right there. That again, he tries to be the highest thing on the tower, right? And so, so this is now isolated. You have the signal going through until it gets to the lightning arrestor. There's a, a spark gap connector inside the, the connector. Some of them use uh, little modules that when static electricity hits or a close lightning strike, it will ground it to ground, okay? So it does not travel into the canisters, okay? So if there's a, if you have a direct lightning hit, whatever's connected to that is gonna to be toast. End of story, okay? We're talking a couple million volts. Um, so it's these near misses these near hits that we're trying to control, right? And the thing about having this uh, tower properly grounded is you're actually creating a null space around the tower so that lightning cannot see the tower. That's the whole idea of grounding. And what I don't see up there are those little, um, that you see at airports a lot when you're looking down uh, you see uh, what looks like uh, they're static arresters that go along the building that people think, oh, that's for the birds so that they don't land on there. No, that is to um, suck all the static electricity because there's a lot of wind coming in with airplanes. Yes, sir. So there is a misconception, and I used to I used to hold the same misconception that a lightning rod is trying to attract the lightning and give it a path to the ground, right? What it actually does is it brings the ground's potential all the way up to the top of the structure. So that to the lightning, the lightning is looking for a convenient path to ground. To the, to the lightning, it looks like that tower is at the same potential as the ground. So it's just as likely to hit the ground as it is to hit the tower or the building with the lightning rod. In up. other words, he's more likely to hit something that isn't grounded. Something else. Right? Yes, that's what we're trying to do. We want the lightning to go somewhere else, right? And so things that are properly grounded, it makes that entity invisible to the lightning, okay? The physics of lightning rods is really kind of cool if you think about it. And it was developed in the 1700s. It's like, how did they figure this out back then? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so all this is happening at the same time, the canisters, the cavities, um, which this is acting up right now, the cavity. Thanks, Steve. I'll pay you later. The, uh, uh, whatever you call these, uh, cylinders, uh, they are, they are filtering, uh, the uh, the signal coming and going, the controller is listening for the PL tone going through his 
magic of waiting a certain time to make sure that the incoming signal is going to be repeated. And then the transmitter happens and it goes up into our, um, goes up into the antenna. So we talked about this subaudible tone. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. And this is something that you have to know with every repeater that you program in. And that is, you have to know the off the frequency offset. We've talked about that already. And the PL tone. Let's just review the frequency offset. Uh, and again, we've already talked about that. On the two meter band, the 144 megahertz band, the offset is 600 kilohertz, which is the same thing as saying 0.6 megahertz. Okay. On the radio, it looks like that. 0, 0, 0.6 and then however many zeros your uh, radio will have. And it's plus or minus, depending on the frequency. Radios that understand that are like the Yesu radios, the Toshiba, the Kenwoods, those ICOMs. Those are the radios that you don't have to worry about the offset direction, okay? Because they have an automatic repeater control that circuitry that already knows that. You can turn on or off. If you're dealing with a Baofeng or a Chinese radio, the TYT, you have to tell it not only negative or positive, but also the actual offset frequency, which in this case, if you're doing two meter, it's 600 kilohertz. For the 1.25 meter, which is the 220 band, the uh, it's a standard of 1.6 megahertz and it is negative offset. And on the radio, it looks like 1.6 megahertz. Go figure. And on the 70 centimeter band or the 440 megahertz, it's always five megahertz negative offset. So, uh, and it's 5.0 megahertz. So that part is easy. There's, there's two things we're looking at, not only the offset frequency, but the direction. And on Chinese radios, you have to program both of those in direction and frequency. Yes, sir. So on my, on some radios, I have my Chinese radios. I program a transmit frequency and a receive frequency. And I have to figure out the offset myself. On so, the yeah. Woods, I tell it, this is the frequency of the repeater and use the offset. And it figures out the transmit frequency by itself. Yep. I don't have to tell it that. So depending on your radio, some of them may want you to program in two separate frequencies. Some may ask for a frequency and an offset, and some may let you do it both ways. It depends on the radio. This is why. This is one reason why I don't like. Did you have a question, Steve? Isn't software available which kind of does that? I was just going to say that. This is why I do not like Chirp because Chirp doesn't understand the automatic repeater. There's a column for transmit and there's a column for receive. You have to know. And have a calculator if you're dealing with something other than five megahertz to see, okay, which one is it? Okay. And it's just the nature of the beast, you know. Uh, RT systems, it's all automagic. You know, you don't have to worry about that stuff. As a matter of fact, it only gives you one column. You know, I want to put in the receive frequency and I got you covered. So if you have a lot of radios to uh, program, Using RT systems is a good thing. If you're, you know, if you don't care, if, uh, you know, Chirp works just fine. Okay, so not a problem. So we have the offset frequency. And we also need to know what the PL tone is. Now, the PL tone is uh, known by a number of names. PL being one of them. PL stands for private line. That is a Motorola term. Okay, it's also known as... I'm sorry. It's a trademark. It's it's trademarked. Yes, uh, it's also known by General Electric as Channel Guard. It's also known as Tone Squelch. Okay, that's the generic term for it. Generally speaking, people will abuse the PL tone, and that's what they use. That's what we use uh, when we talk about the sub audible tone. I refer to it as the PL tone. Okay, but PL tone is the same thing as the uh, tone squelch. The important thing to understand is uh, the PL tone tells the repeater to repeat 
the accompanying RF signal, you know, the, the, uh, 100, the 220, uh, 2.36 megahertz stuff that, that he's hearing. Okay. Without the PL tone, like we discussed, the repeater will not repeat your signal. And so if you're wondering why, boy, I have the frequency correct, but when I transmit, no one can hear me. Well, it's either one of three things. One, you are don't have the right PL tone. Two, the offset frequency is wrong. Or three, the direction is wrong. It's generally one of those three things. And most times it's the PL tone. Okay. The PL tone itself is a sub audible. As far as an analog goes, it's a, the analog sub audible tone ranging from 67 hertz to 254.1 hertz. And they've divided that into 50 iterations or 50 graduations, starting with 67 hertz. And I, I used to be able to hear 67 hertz. I can't hear that anymore very well. Um, and then 254 hertz. These are tones that you can hear, okay? Uh, but they're they're sent at the same time. Also, you there's another type of PL uh, tone called digital code, using a digital code sequence. And that's referred to as DCS, digital code squelch, okay? Now, I'm willing to give somebody 13 rubles if they can tell me what does CTCSS stand for, because that is not JAM. No, no, before, okay. before we go there, there's a question from online. Okay. Um, Paul would like you to explain why it's not really private, even though it's called a privacy phone. Okay, very good. So you see these marketing uh, packs, especially on FRS radios, you go to Walmart and you see this uh, pair of radios that's good for 34 miles and you have 255 privacy tones, okay? <laughs> privacy codes. So that is telling everybody, everybody look in the back and this gentleman, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Martin. Martin. Yeah. Sorry. I... <laughs> this is the first radio we got. And uh, Midland, and uh, it was it's there okay. We got it, you know, the lake, and we actually surprisingly got five or ten miles a few times. Sure. And, and at the lake, it's pretty good. But you know, we graduated on to other things. But uh, but yeah, this these are pretty basic. The battery indicator doesn't even actually indicate a level of the battery. <laughs> <laughs> you you get what you pay for. Yeah. They have their purpose though. Yeah. Okay. That they, they are not. They're not garbage. They are useful tools. Okay. I have a bunch of them in my toolkit. And on our third meeting this month, uh, Dan will be not this Dan, but the other Dan will be talking about a tiered communication setup using FRS, GMRS, and Ham Radio. So come come to that meeting if you're interested. Yes. So back to the question at hand or the, or the comment at hand. So these uh, bubble pack radios, they say you, there's uh, X amount of um, privacy codes. And what people are thinking is, ah, I can now have a private conversation to my buddy on the Jeep trail, okay? All that means is that privacy tone is controlling the squelch, when to open your squelch on your radio, okay? That's all he does. For, let me give you an example, for the Murray Amateur Radio Club, our PL tone is 103.5 hertz. When I transmit, if I am transmitting a sub-audible tone of 103.5 hertz, the repeater hears that because he's looking for that tone. When he hears that, he will open the squelch at, in the repeater, right? And he'll then continue on with the uh, with repeating that signal. When you are using that from radio to radio, 
whether it's an FRS radio or a GMRS radio or a ham radio or a MERS radio or any radio that uses PL tones, and it's not encrypted, it's not a military radio or a FEMA radio, right? Um, then what is happening is the squelch is being controlled. In other words, if I want to talk to Sherwood and we have uh, a PL tone of 103.5 Hertz set up between the two, when I'm transmitting and his radio is listening and hears that 103.5 hertz, he will open the squelch up and he will hear what I am saying. Without that, the radio will not open the squelch, okay? That's not to say that you can't hear what I'm saying because all he has to do is turn off the PL, the privacy squelch function on his radio and he will hear every conversation. It doesn't matter if I have a PL tone set or not. OK, as a matter of fact, on the FRS radios, you turn it to uh, channel zero, uh, which turns off the PL squelch and you hear everything. OK, so the PL is not a privacy line or privacy uh, tone. OK, it controls the squelch of the radio. Um, and people are amazed when. They think they're talking privately, and they're really not. No, not. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So we have digital codes, and we also have analog subaudible tones. Now, you, <laughs> for repeaters, you have to know if the repeater is using a transmit and a receive, because there is that possibility. Your radios, every single radio will have the option of, of, configuring the transmit CTCSS or the receive CTCSS. Oh, back to my extra credit with 13 rules. What does CTCSS stand for? Oh. Uh, continuous tone. Continuous, yeah. <laughs> continuous control flow system. Excellent. Continuous CCT C TCSS, Continuous Tone Coded Squelch System. I know. I'm not going to. That's why we call it PL. That's why we call it a PL tone, yes. Now, on your radios, that CTCSS, if you, there's enough characters on it, it may say CTCSS, but it could say CDC. Okay, like the Baofengs show. Whatever it is on your radio, make sure you know what it is because you have to set it. Uh, all the re okay, not all repeaters in Utah require a PL tone. Some of them will work without the PL tone. Most of them are configured for 100 hertz. And it's always just the transmit side the, as in a relationship to the radio, the, the HT. Okay, so I need to transmit. I, we could just as easily set the repeater to also transmit a PL tone so that the radio has to hear that in order for the squelch to open, okay? Um, but and nobody in Utah do, does that. I'm sorry? It could be a different tone. And it could be a different tone. Which is terrible. Whenever yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for that matter, because it's a radio... Um, the offset frequency and direction can also be modified. So a lot of people do that. A lot of club organizations that I know personally, they'll go ahead and transmit on one frequency. And if it's we're transmitting on two meter, this is all simplex, um, then we are receiving on that frequency on a particular PL tone when I transmit on the other side, it's using another PL tone, you know. Um, however you want to do it, whatever floats your boat. We're almost done. Uh, let's see. There are 348 slides. I'm on 16. <laughs> so did you get the email to bring your sleeping bags? <laughs> okay, okay, good. So the menu, like I already said, will will say uh, receive CTCSS or whatever they call it, receive DCS, transmit DCS. Uh, again, 
in Utah, you don't have to worry about the receive side. It's always just the transmit side. Mark uses a PL tone of 103.5. So you set your transmit on 222.36 to 103.5 hertz. And you'll then be able to talk to the repeater. The repeater then transmits on 22396, which is my receive, right? And you'll be able to uh, talk. This is why on your HTs or mobile radios, we show the receive frequency and not the transmit frequency of the repeater, but you have to know both. That's what that offset is. So my question to you is, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Even though it's not needed here, does the repeater repeat the PL tone? No. It strips it out. Yeah. Some do and some don't. Yeah, I, thank you. It depends on the repeater. It depends on the repeater. Yeah. Don't don't count on it. Basically, as I'm saying, yeah. your receiving radio filters below those frequencies. That's why they call them sub up sub audio audi audible. Certain people could hear them if they came across, but your the audio part of your radio is filtering it out. Yeah, so your radio can hear it, but then it filters it out because it's not important. Right, right. Um, and one other thing to add to that. When you're transmitting the PL tone, I just lost my train of thought. Holy moly. Okay, I'll entertain additional questions. Yes, sir. Occasionally, when I'm listening, I hear people say pause for reset. What is that about? Very good question. What people do is on their radios, they have a configuration setting called TOT. And if you look at your HT, you'll probably see a TOT and then it'll have some number. That's how many minutes. That's total total time that you can transmit before the radio shuts down. Okay. So they're having a long QSO or a long conversation. They they transmitted. Uh, they can't remember if it was 30 seconds that they turned the TOT timer on or three minutes. And so they'll go ahead and say, uh, you know, pause for reset. So that resets that timer. So that's on their local radio. Yes. And yep. On the repeater. Some repeaters also. And the repeater. Oh. Depends on the repeater. Okay. There's a TOT time uh, for Murray Amateur Radio Club. We have it set to three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't be talking three minutes without understanding. That, that's also protection against a stuck PTT button. Excellent comment. So you're you have your HT on your hip. You get into your car. You didn't turn off your radio. You're driving down the street, and your seatbelt is pushing the PTT button, and everybody can hear what's going on. You don't realize everybody can hear what's going on, and. You at least have three minutes. We have at least three minutes of entertainment before the <laughs> DOT timer is hit. Yes, sir. Is that the repeaters timeout things? Some of them can recognize the fact that when when one person stops, another person starts. Other repeaters cannot recognize that. So if you do not have a space, thank you, Dave, for that. If you do not have a space between transmissions, two parties are talking to the repeater. Some repeaters, um, I call them sloppy repeaters, uh, will they'll they'll hold the transmit for just a couple of a quarter second, but that's long enough for the next person to get on there, and they don't even have to have a PL tone. They can just keep talking. And it's already transmitting. And it's already transmitting. Yeah. Um, other repeaters are very quick to, as soon as that stops, it's now receiving, you know, it's not transmitting anymore. Depends on the repeater. Every repeater has their own personality. I don't know if you knew that. Um, you just have to know what your person, your personality is, uh, the repeater that you're talking to. Yes, sir. So can you say a few words about simplex repeaters or parroting type repeaters? Okay, um, 
I can. It'll be very few words. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and, and talk about simplex repeaters? Okay, maybe I should come up there so that... I yeah, please do. Audio. Um, so there is a concept of something called a simplex repeater where it just has one radio and you, you'll typically hear them also called parrot repeaters where basically when you are talking, the repeater is listening to you and it's recording what you're saying. And then when you unkey, then it transmits everything that you just said. So you get to hear it. So you get to hear it twice if you can hear both transmissions, it right? Recorded on. It it records it in a memory buffer or on a tape or something like that. It depends on the on the machine. Oh. Uh, there's also on the inner tie, I think the Bear Lake repeater is a parrot. At least it used to be a simplex repeater where what it hears from the inner tie it sends out. And what you send, what it hears from local, it sends to the inner tie, but it's not a local repeater. So other people in that area can only hear you on simplex. It doesn't do parroting, but it does. It's like a remote base, not like a full scale repeater. Was it Berlin or was it Malad? It might be Malad. I, I'm not sure. I, I know one of them on the inner tie, and it may not be that way anymore. But I remember years ago, at least, one of the setups on the inner tie had this, this condition. We didn't talk about length repeaters or anything. No. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so if you're if you're on a repeater like that, you need to be cognizant of the fact. Um, and also, I don't remember who said it, but when you're using a repeater, it's a good idea to key up and wait a moment before you start talking because sometimes it either doesn't listen to the first part, or if it's a repeater network, you've got to wait for that key up to happen across the whole network. We can talk about repeater networks another time, but that's been my observations. Sit down. You're done. I'm done. <laughs> I wanted to get a rise out of Dave, and I got it. So thank you, Jen. Yes, sir. Uh, if we have the big earthquake, when we have the when, big earthquake. I'll accept that. How, what's the possibility of that power going down? Not down, but um, not being able to transmit any more. Um, a very good possibility. As a matter of fact, probably so. That is why we're trying to get emergency power to that. Right now, it is just on utility power. So when the grid goes down, and this is what we're trying to impress upon Murray City to understand, we this is supposed to be the backup. We're supposed to be the backup arm of communications for Murray Fire, okay, using our 220 repeater. But as soon as the earthquake happens, our repeater is going down. Huh? They pulled that. That. Generator, I think the generator might still be there, but they took the propane tank away. Yeah. yeah. And that generator has not been hooked up in years. So yeah. uh, it was not. Said the batteries, are dead. batteries are toast. Yeah. So, you know, we have a plan. it is. Yeah. We just well, need we to have that plan for a long time. We just need not, I need Mary City to come up with the funding. Plan. I'm I'm gonna to talk to Joey again on that. And so we have a bunch of plans. Let's put it that way. Yes. And uh we need to make some of these plans actually start happening. So thank you, Dan. Okay, I'm just looking at uh the questions there. You've been doing the question just fine, right? So you've been seeing yeah, there's those. One new one uh, the from Paul. He says the negative offset on 70 centimeter is a regional choice. Utah puts repeaters on 445 to 449, 9754975 with a negative offset. Florida, on the other hand, has repeaters on 440 to 445 with a positive offset. And thanks, Paul, for uh, bringing that up. 
because we have a lot of frequencies floating around, there has to be some entity that coordinates all of the frequencies. Utah has a frequency coordinator, okay? And all of the, the body that controls that decides what the standard is. So you have to actually go onto the VHF Society webpage because uh, I believe they are the controlling body of that. John being the official uh, frequency coordinator to find out what the various, what the plan is for Utah, because our plan is different from Colorado, which is different from California that doesn't have a plan. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. And, and yes, those coordinators for different states do have to talk to each other because repeaters that are close to the state border might impact. Yep. other repeaters in the other state. Yeah. So, so indeed, it could be a negative offset. It could be a positive offset. Um, that's why I said earlier, here it's negative five megahertz, but uh, in Minneapolis, it could be something else. Or you could do it yourself. You can program your own and really confuse the issue. Uh, you won't talk to repeater that way, but simplex communications, people people change the, the rules. They're really not supposed to. You're supposed to stick with the, the plan. Also, in uh, Salt Lake County, we have what's called the Salt Lake County Aries Standard Load. And what that is, is a, gr a grouping, a a agreed upon frequency division of each city, what they're allowed to transmit on and consequently receive on after the big one hits. Okay, so they're not, chances are most of the repeaters like ours will not survive a grid down event. Some of them, they do have battery backup. Some of them have solar panels. Some of them have generators. Um, and so that's only good till the fuel burns out, right? So each city has their own frequency dedicated to them so that we're not walking on each other. That's called the standard load. And you can go to the, the MARC webpage. You can go to Salt Lake County Aries uh, page, uh, webpage to uh, download that standard load. It is built for... 128 channels. So we we built that load for the lowest common denominator radio, which holds 128 channels. Okay. Uh, but if you have more channels, the standard load goes beyond that. It, you know, it, it adds a lot more channels, but we put the most important stuff in the first 128 slots. So any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. There's the QR code. You can download this, uh, um, this presentation and feel free to make fun of it. And it'll be on our website too, right? It'll be on our website, yes. And I thank you very much for attending. 73.